do now on the screen. We already finished that, and we are going to finish the last component of nuclear chemistry, and we've talked about the learning goal for the unit, so we won't go back through. And the last thing that we want to talk about in this very short chapter that will be quizzed on with gas laws, so sometime next week, is radioactive decay rates. And radioactive decay rates are measured in half-lives. And Jason, you were the one who asked about half-lives for different radioactive elements the other day. And I we'll take a look at them. Minute. Say it again? I just asked about the minutes. Oh, just, I thought you asked about the half-lives. No, I just asked about the Then I have the wrong person, possibly the wrong question. I thought he did, too. Yeah. Doesn't even remember what he asked. All right. A half-life, abbreviated T1 half, is the time required for one half of the radioisotope or radioactive isotope's nucleus to decay into its products. And elements have unique half-lives. And it's not even just unique for an element per se. You can have isotopes of the same element with different half-lives. And we can take a look at some of those half-lives shown here. These are really, really quickies, 10 to the negative 24 seconds. For example, hydrogen 7, hydrogen 5, hydrogen 4. I've never worked with any of those. They're not very common. Another series here. Let's get to some of the ones that were more, that at least I'm more comfortable working with or have worked with in the past. You have to be 18 to work with radioactivity probably because it can be harmful to you, especially if you're not careful. So for example, right here, and this is getting into days now, uh, P32 is a radioactive element that I've used in the laboratory to label DNA. You know DNA contains phosphorus because it has phosphate groups. I don't think I've worked with anything very rare. Um, in the lab, I work with P32 to label DNA. I work with S35 to label proteins. There are two amino acids that contain sulfur, methionine and cysteine, and so you can label up your protein with S35 instead of S32. The one that I worked with that's probably the most dangerous that you typically don't work with anymore because they have um, different methods would be I-125. And that one can be very, very dangerous. I remember using it in Western blots. Um, it's radioactive iodine. And the problem there is that um, it can affect thyroid function. Yeah, so, and that, was, uh, well, was it I-125 or a different one? I'm not sure. that caused her cancer no, or that, that was tr treated, treated it? Because the guy was taking an iodine and he set himself iodine. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense, actually. Yeah, ask her which one it was. Let us know. Um, I went 25 in the lab to, I used it two different ways, actually, for Western blots and also I remember feeding cells I went 25, but I can't remember why. It was a long time ago. You know, once it gets back a few decades, the brain goes dead. But yeah, S35 is the other one I've commonly used, I-125. So these have half-lives in days. I actually had looked up I-125 because I couldn't remember. Um, well, this is I-129. Well, I-125 is also going to be about the same range. And the one that you probably have heard of the most is carbon-14 because they always talk about C-14 dating in middle school when you're trying to figure out how old certain rocks and things like that are. So there are a whole bunch of radioisotopes and you know it's not something but you can see that the half-lives really vary from seconds to days to years to billion years to trillion years etc. So you can work through and take a look see and I believe I had that link in your notes for those of you dying to know. Yep. So like what's the most radioactive? 
When you say most radioactive, there are a few things to consider. It depends on what its decay process is. So the ones that are going to be emitting gamma particles are going to be the one that could be most detrimental to you. But you don't only want to consider what it's releasing. You want to consider the half-life of the radioactive element because the ones that stay around longer can cause problems for longer periods of time, whereas the ones with real quick half-lives, they're just going to disintegrate to nothing very quickly. So there's a couple factors to consider there. So I'm not sure because you'd have to take both factors into consideration. In any event, with the radioactive decay series, for example, the half-life of radioisotope strontium-90, mass number of 90, is 29 years. So if you're looking at its decay series, you want to be able to figure out how much of the substance would be left after one or more half-lives. So if, for example, you have a 10-gram sample, and it goes through one half-life. After one half-life, which in this case is 29 days, you have one half the amount you started with, or five grams. If it goes through another half-life, you divide five by two, and you'll have two and a half grams, so that would be 58 years later. And then another half-life would get you to half of that, or 1.25 grams. So if you know the half-life, and how much substance you started with, you can figure out the amount remaining after a certain period of time or a certain number of half-lives. For example, with amount remaining, this is the initial amount. That's what you started with. Times one-half to the n power, where n is equal to the number of half-lives that the sample has gone through. You can calculate n by dividing the total time that has elapsed by the half-life. That'll give you n, so one-half to the n power, times whatever amount you started with. I already showed you that each radioisotope has its own characteristic half-life, and we can work through a series of simple problems to address this concept which you'll be very good at. It's mathy. It's really very simplistic. All right, let's take a look. The first example says iron 59 is used in medicine to diagnose blood circulation disorders. Why would you use iron to diagnose a blood circulation disorder? Because that's what's in your blood. Because that's what's in your blood because it actually makes up hemoglobin in your blood that carries oxygen to all parts of the body. If the body doesn't get oxygen, you are not going to make it. The half-life of iron, 59, is 44.5 days. How much of a 2.000 milligram sample will remain after 133.5 days? There are a couple of ways to approach this. We can walk through. I like to get the information down just like we do with all problem solving. It says that the half-life T1 half is 44.5 days. The initial amount is what you start with, and that's equal to 2.000 milligrams, and the total time is 133.5 days. And we want to know how much remains, so the amount remaining. And again, if you pull the information out, you're far more likely to be successful here. As we mentioned previously, you can calculate this, where the amount remaining is equal to 
the initial amount one half to the n and n is the total time over the half-life so you have 133.5 days over 44.5 days brightly green right so the initial amount we labeled off one half to the third power please remember that two to the third is eight got to be good with exponents in this nine weeks and especially the next nine weeks so you basically have one eighth of two two eighths is a quarter and that's what you've got and if you don't see it in your head you can multiply it out if you wish Sig figs go based on the initial amount as such. And I just want to diagram that out for you, too, in case you can't get the formula to rip. There's another way to approach it. So n is how many half-lives you've gone through, and you established that n was 3 here. So you want to go through three half-lives. So if you start with two milligrams and you go through a half-life, how many milligrams will you have? One half of that or one. And then another half-life. And then another half-life. So that's just another approach. And again, I like the covering the nuclear chemistry concept. It's something that is listed as an honors requirement. You don't find it in AP anymore. You might not see it in general chem, but it is part of SAT2 chem, and some of you should look into taking that after AP chem. Questions here? Do you want to try the next one yourselves, or you want to do it together? You want to try? Yes, yes? It's on the screen at the top. How we do? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes? And if you don't see it from this formula, you can just go 10 to 5, 5 to 2 and a half, 2 and a, you can just keep going down to 1.25 and then half of that.
they can know how many times they can seize. Whatever they give you, they get back. Okay, the last problem is very, very similar, but they don't give you an initial amount, so you just assume that it's one, make it simple. It says a radioactive element has a half-life of two days. Which fraction represents the original, I'm sorry, represents the amount of an original sample of this element remaining after 10 days? So how many half-lives did you go through? Five. So all you do is one half to the fifth power. Because you know in terms of n that you had 10 days divided by the half-life, so that's 5, and then 1 half to the 5th power is just 1 over 32. So you can get it fractionally as well. And I did give you one of these easy questions on your quiz as well, and that's all that's on the quiz is the do now and this, and maybe I'll add the band of stability since you like that. Okay, the last part of the lesson, I also think you've probably seen from middle school. You probably didn't do the math so much in middle school. You might have just halved it each way. I'm not sure how you approached it. The last few things I want to mention, first with radiochemical dating, we already mentioned some of this already, uh, you will see that chemical reaction rates are greatly affected when you alter the temperature. For example, that's why we've heated many of our reactions this year. When we increase the temperature, we increase the speed at which the reaction occurs. Pressure, concentration, volume, catalysts can have similar effects, and we'll be exploring that in our kinetic chapter in the fourth nine weeks. You don't see changes in nuclear reaction rates when you make these types of changes. Half-lives for radioisotopes are constant, and so you can use radioisotopes to age or determine the age of an object. And when you do that, it's referred to as radiochemical dating. And again, the best example I can think of is something you would have probably looked at in earth science, which would be C14 dating. The last piece of the puzzle I want to mention is nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. With fission, we're going to split up the nucleus into fragments. With fusions, we're going to combine atomic nuclei. So a fusion reaction is going to look more like a synthesis that we talked about previously. I have a cute little video that discusses all of this. And we'll take a look. Oh, I turned... I usually just leave it on, but the kids said it was like, it, it sounded like um, Rice Krispies. They were like snap, crackle, pop. It was annoying. Yeah, the kids were like, maybe I turned it off. Yes, I don't remember. Hey. I thought I did. Let's. Is it because I have a microphone plugged in? Um, I in all of science. It was. I had a microphone plugged in. Oh, well, I get a microphone. All right. Hang on. E equals MC. Wait, are you still recording? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fusion and fission are cousins, the yin and yang of nuclear physics. Both turn matter into energy using the most famous equation in all of science, E equals mc squared. The equation tells us that matter can turn into energy 
And when it does, it gets multiplied by the speed of light squared, a very big number. Both fusion and fission convert a little bit of matter into a lot of energy. So how do they differ? Fission means to come apart. Imagine a tablet of Alka-Seltzer dissolving in a glass of water. Fusion happens when atoms come together, when two become one. In both cases, we end up with a little less mass than what we started with. That missing mass multiplies by c squared to become e. In fission, the fizzing happens on its own. Radioactive elements such as uranium and plutonium split apart without any product from us. This makes fission relatively easy to control. It's why it's used in all existing nuclear power plants. Unfortunately, the stuff that uranium and plutonium fizzes into is toxic and radioactive, creating the byproduct that we call nuclear waste. Fusion is cleaner and more powerful, but it's much more difficult to achieve. It requires slamming hydrogen ions together with such incredible violence that they overcome the repulsive forces pushing them apart. As a result, they fuse into helium. Today, fusion only happens in places with incredible temperatures and pressures, like the center of the sun, or a hydrogen bomb. But scientists are trying to squeeze hydrogen atoms together with powerful magnetic fields or laser beams, allowing us to control the fusion reaction and extract its energy. Yet all this squeezing takes a lot of energy, much more than we've been able to get out of the process. Because of this, the first fusion power plants are decades, if not centuries away. Until then, fission, as the only MC squared we'll be able to use for energy. For Scientific Americans Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Poynter. So exactly as he illustrated in regard to fission, the breaking apart, where you're going to uh, generate maybe the same atom or different atoms, which is more likely to occur. It releases a lot of energy, and very often one reaction can lead to another, and so what you get are chain reactions. Nuclear power plants he mentioned. Fusion is the reverse process where you force two atoms to fuse together, you generate a new atom. These can release quite a bit of energy, but it requires very, very high temperatures, and that's why they said it only occurs in a few places. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that you know that radiation can damage living cells, cause mutations to DNA. This is why with radioactivity you have to be over 18 and hopefully mature enough to use it. When you work in a laboratory, they give you a film badge that you clip to your lab coat, and that shows your exposure to radiation for that month. So you turn your badge in every month, and you see what your exposure was. And if at any time it's very high, then they need to look at um, your laboratory to make sure you're practicing safely, because they don't want any be, anyone to be overly exposed to radiation, because it can be extremely dangerous. In regard to your lesson today, you should have a basic understanding of nuclear decay series, as we mentioned already, how to calculate the amount of sample remaining. That's what I'm most likely to ask you. Understand that radioisotopes have unique half-lives. And then in regard to the unit as a whole, you should be able to write and balance nuclear equations. I think most of you found that to be rather simplistic. Understand the different types of radiation. We mentioned alpha particles, beta particles, gamma particles, positron emission, electron capture. And then finally, you should have some understanding of how radioactivity was discovered. I showed you a few videos there. Um, although I'm not one to really ask about the people per se, I think it's just more important that you understand um, how the X-ray was discovered, as well as the Curie's major contribution to discovering both radium and polonium. 
questions in regard to nuclear chemistry? You can finish up classwork 3.x. You can now do all of it. The last three questions on the second page review what we did today, and that will be an indication as to whether you understand the concept. You should be able to finish all of that, and that leaves you with no homework for the weekend. Yes?